Bravo. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so wonderful to be back here. And I'm keeping up my batting average. So this is my eighth speech in seven conferences at Sphere IT, which is, I don't think anybody else has that record. Which is, so I've got a second record, but it's not a Guinness one. So as Pavel said, recently I joined about six months ago, I changed company. I moved out of finance, and I've been doing finance for as long as I can remember now, far too many years. And I moved to a company called The Trade Desk. And this is what uh, Wikipedia has said. They add tech. They support advertisers and advertising agencies to bid on advertising space on the internet. And the reason it, I got interested in this, and the reason when the agent spoke to me that I thought, oh, well, that sounds fun, is like they deal with 500 billion impressions per day. That's approximately 11 million impressions a second that they get incoming into their stream. They bid on all sorts of things, internet advertising, audio, digital out of home, that's those digital advertising boards you see now everywhere, and connected TV. And you have to respond to those in 100 milliseconds. Right? Each bid request has to be responded in 100 milliseconds. So this is really big data, really tight tolerances, lots of exciting fun. And it has to run 24-7, 365. It's not like banking that runs you know, Monday to Friday. Was I intrigued? Oh, yes. This, if you've watched any of my other talks at Sphere IT, this is my bag. This is what I do. So let's put the, the IT department at the trade desk in. If we start on the, on the right-hand side, this is me over here. Systems engineering, build big systems, make them perform really well, worry about them not falling over, all that kind of stuff, right through to normal developers, analysts, to data scientists. But when I was in the interview process, they were like, actually, we've got, would you like mind joining the data science group? We don't have any software engineers. We've got 120, 130 data scientists, but no software engineers. And we think they need some. So this is how it started. But what they didn't tell me when I said, oh, that sounds interesting, is I wasn't joining the data science group. No. They have a small group which is a research group. These are AI and machine learning researchers, you know, trying to look for the next three to five years out, trying to look at cutting edge you know, ideas in data science, so graph machine learning, for example. All sorts of really fun stuff. So I've moved from that end of the scale to this end of the scale. And let me be clear. Technically, I did do a degree in computer science and artificial intelligence. But that was 20 years ago. Since then, I've done nothing in this field. I know no machine learning. I know no data science. So I've come into this pretty cold. So they gave me an introduction. One of our first meetings we had, the team got together and we're presenting a, a sort of educational session on, on interesting things that are out there in the world. And one of my colleagues put up this slide. <laughs> Does anybody recognize it? Well, I certainly didn't. You should recognize it. If I tell you what it's used for, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. This is a key component. This is, I'm going to have to read it out because I can't even say the entire thing. Denoising diffusion probabilistic models. Does that make any clearer? No? So it's a key component in DALI 2. So the fancy thing that generates all these AI images now. Uh, and what it's all about is actually you take an image, you add noise, and you have to predict what the original image looked like without the noise. I'm not sure I can infer that from that. I don't know about anybody else. So that was literally one of my first sessions I had with these guys. And I'm sitting there going, I literally don't understand a word you're saying. So over those few months, I've, I've learned a bit. I'm still not a machine learning or AI expert. Please don't get me wrong. But I thought I would share the observations coming from a software and engineering background and moving into data science. What, what have I observed? So let's start with language. Now, 
They say a lot of words that I recognize. They talk about models. They talk about correlations. They talk about experiments. But one of the things I noticed very quickly is their version of those words is not my version of those words. To them, they mean something very specific and, and precise. A model for me, when I talk about I've modeled something in code, you know, I've created some classes, I've got a bit of structure out, I've, I've started building an application. Now, a model in there is something you train, like a genetic, you know, genetic algorithm or a neural network. You train a model and then you apply it in production. So I confused several of my colleagues by continually using models and the word model in the first bit of software I built for them. But they talk about all sorts of other things, correlations, Bayesian theorem. You know, words I vaguely recognize, but I have no way of manipulating them. And I realized that data science and software engineering really are a bit like a doctor and a software engineer. We, have, we all use English, but actually, there's a whole bunch of very specific language that has very specific meanings, and software engineering is the same. But we don't think about it, because that's what we do every day. You know, we talk about complexity, we talk about big O, we talk about all sorts of things. And yet, you know, when you speak to someone outside of your sphere, they don't really get what those concepts mean. Reading. Now, this blew my mind. When I think about reading, what do I do? So I'm programming away. I see an error that I've never seen before. You know, I'm now using Spark, and I've got a new error message I've never seen. What's the first thing we do? We Google it. Exactly. Right? We Google it, and we scan Google enough to go, oh, try this setting. OK, we'll try that setting. Oh, we'll try it, you know. And I, I work through as quickly as possible, scan, skimming text to get to an answer that fixes my problem. These guys don't read like that. They might scan abstracts and conclusions of papers, but when they pick up a paper to read, they can spend an entire day on it, or two because they will read to understand in detail. You know, they'll look at the maths and make sure they understand the maths. You know, this is a, it really struck me as odd, because in software engineering, I spend so much time just trying to learn just enough to fix the next problem. You know, I was playing with Kubernetes recently and trying to remember how to change the execution command in Docker. You know, and I Googled it, and I got the right answer, and I made it work. But I didn't go and learn the whole of Docker. I didn't go and read the entire documentation site until I understood it word for word. So how they read leads to a second observation. What I've called here deep time. These guys spend a lot of time, you know, I know Software developers in the room, do you spend a lot of time when you're in the office with headphones on trying to get some focus time? Yeah, few. <laughs> right. They spend a lot of time in pure single person focus time. They then spend time talking about it, but the amount of time and the expectation that we have, we have a stand up in our team. It's on Monday afternoon, it's not every day. Because the expectation is you spend two or three days working on something. There's no point giving a report every day. You know, I fixed this bug, I fixed that bug, I did the other thing, I looked at that. No, it's like, you know, what did you do? Well, I've spent the week reading a paper. So it's interesting that that's the norm. And I find, you know, in program, we need deep time. But often, our deep time gets sliced and diced. Especially if you manage people, you end up with loads of meetings. You end up with lots of interruptions where the communication channels these guys use tend to be asynchronous. They'll drop a message in Slack, but you're not expecting a response anytime soon. It'll be tomorrow when they see it. And the last one that really struck me is about accuracy. I worked in finance, which means that when you're generating a number, you've got two choices. You either generate the right number, or if you can't do that, you fail explosively to generate no number. Generating a number that's near is not good enough. You, you, you can't do it. You know, with financial systems, if I can't produce the right answer, I should produce no answer at all. 
when you talk about model accuracy, you're like, well, you know, you talk about some of the competitions, the Kaggle competitions. The difference between the, the person who won and the person who came second is 0.1% accuracy or even less. You know, there's a different set of scales here. At the trade desk, for example, what happens when uh, we can't cope with the volume of ad impressions we see? We throw them on the floor. You just don't respond to them. What do we do when one of the servers dies? Well, you know, we lost some ad impressions. It doesn't matter, there's plenty of them. You start to think about things a different way. Modeling, especially in machine learning, is about you know, improving your accuracy, but you're not necessarily aiming for 100%. You can't hit 100%. There's enough noise in the data that you'll never hit it. But it just made me really think that I've spent, and this was one of the things I really struggled with when I started, which is I'm used to trying to produce exactly one answer and the same answer every time for the same input. And they're like, yeah, it doesn't matter. The last point I thought was, was interesting before I go into some of the more challenging aspects is asking different questions. So as a, as a software engineer, I get a JIRA, it has some acceptance criteria, it has a bug report, it says it doesn't do this, it should do this. And we spend our time you know, working through those, but we never ask the next deeper question. It's like the question that the, 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 the scientists in my group really ask is not only what does success look like, which is a very common agile question, but it's also how do we measure it? When you say, we're going to make the UI better, the software developer says, yeah, we'll tweak some buttons, we'll do some stuff. The data scientist says, how do I know that I've made the UI better? Is it misclicks? What measure am I going to use, and how am I going to measure it? And I found that, that fascinating, because it made me rethink how I define the problems I'm trying to solve. It's like, not only what a success looked like, does the system work? But how do I measure those, those successes? So, so to sum up, data scientists optimize for insight and knowledge. Right? You're trying to discover new things based on a pile of information you have. When I start from a software engineering background, I think about performance, I think about stability, I think about repeatability. We're coming from completely different angles. And this leads to some challenges, which I'll come to in a moment. But really, fundamentally, we're all trying to optimize for business value. The business value that a data scientist gives is insight into the data. Tell me something from this data set that we didn't know before. As a systems engineer, where I added value is making sure that at 9 a.m. Monday morning, the system would be running every Monday morning. You know, we work on software quality, system stability, error tracking, all those things to make software better. But we don't really necessarily think about it in terms of discovering new knowledge. Sometimes we do, but it's, it's, a, it's a side effect. So, on to some of the interesting challenges I've seen. Notebooks, Jupyter Notebooks, Scala Notebooks, Spark Notebooks. Oh my God, it's like being back in the 80s. You know, they're great for quick experiments. If you've got some data set that you can load from S3, you can munge it in Spark, you can get some results, they're wonderful but they are truly terrible as a code management platform. I remember when I started programming at college, you would have a directory, and when you had a version that was sort of working, you copied it, you know, CP minus R to data underscore back or underscore one or underscore two. None of this Git stuff, none of that. that we didn't really have, well, Git existed, but nobody used it. When people are using notebooks, this is exactly what they do. They've got 17 copies of their notebook with various labels on, none of which make any sense. And the crazy part is, you come in the next morning 
having created a notebook and you were using it successfully on Monday night, and you come in on Tuesday, you start up the cluster again, you hit run, it goes, nope. Why? Because a notebook's not a program. It's a series of executions that have already happened and some state that's in memory. So when you change the middle bit and you change the variable name, it just goes, it goes, oh, I, yeah, I've got an old variable called that. I'll just carry on running. And when you get to the end, it goes, no, this, this is not a real program. That drove me nuts. And the editors, oh, my God. You know, some of them occasionally you can do control space and it will give you some hints, but it's useless. Compared to using a modern IDE, any modern IDE, you know, I'm not even going to compare and contrast which IDE I prefer. Any of them are better than what you get by default in this world. So as I said, they're great for small code experiments. They're terrible at long-term code management. And then what happens is the data scientist goes, oh, I've got, some, I've got a model. Here's my notebook throws it over the wall, and some poor developer now has to try and turn this into production code. So this is really, I know I've just mentioned this on the previous slide, but this is really one of the bugbears. And it's a problem I know that exists, and I, I've spoken to some of the, the senior guys in traders. I haven't dealt with this a lot myself in this organization but I have seen it from, from discussion with others. The amount of rework that's done. Someone builds a model, they do something, and then we start taking, we want to take that knowledge and apply it to production. Make our filtering of ad impressions better. Whatever it is. But turning a notebook into an application is a pain. And then if you want to make changes to it, it's even worse. So let's reimagine. First of all, I'm going to start with the question that the data scientist asks. How do we measure success? Well, the first one for me is actually total cost of ownership. One of the problems with, well, let's, let's be honest, the waterfall model, building something, throwing it over to the wall to the next team to deal with, might be quick for the person doing that piece of development. But as a total system, as a total management, especially when there's like, oh, then I want to change, it's incredibly expensive. And speed. One of the, the things, that you, you know, as a data scientist, with a notebook, you can be very quick to get from nothing to insight. So you can't take away from that. And if I try to take away from that for a data scientist, they're not going to do it. You know, we can make rules, right? You've got to write code in this way. And that, those rules aren't, just aren't going to work, are they? You know, as a software developer, you know, we still, we're, we're as bad as they are. You know, things that get in the way of our speed of doing what we do tend to be ignored. And repeatability. You know, I accept I've yet to find good ways to measure all of these as a whole thing. And this is one of what I consider my challenges. Is I want to make the process as a whole better. And I want to put my software engineering hat on and go, how can I make the data scientist life's better, and the downstream team's better. And how can we do that together? There's some interesting thoughts. You can, you can see this the fantastic chart. Now, the first thing to notice about this chart is uh, my current colleagues would kill me for providing this chart because it does have labels on the axes, but no scale. This could be, you know, 0% to 100% or 0% to 10%. But what I want to talk about is, let's look at what happens with projects. One of the problems with notebooks is a five-line notebook is great. A 2,000-line notebook is chaos. It's completely unmanageable. Right? Your editor is awful. You can't see what's being used. You put it into an IDE and your IDE says, ah, oh, yes, I understand all this. I can give you syntax highlighting. I can give you jump to definition. I can, do, you know, I can check all the variables are defined. But in your, in your notebook, you've got none of that. So when you start a project, any project, and this could be a notebook or this could be a software project, there's two key points in time. 
The first is this startup lag. If I start a new Scala project, how long is it going to take me from the point at which I start with an empty console to the point where I'm actually writing code for that application? Right? And if I have to install the right version of the JRE, it could be several hours for anybody who's gone through the JRE hell. But then you reach, so you've got going. You're in your notebook, you're in your IDE, you're writing code, everything's going. The project's growing, it's getting bigger. As projects get bigger, they get more unwieldy. Now, Justin talked uh, yesterday about large projects and how suddenly, you know, at what point do you want Bazel? And typically, you realize you want Bazel just after your build has thrown you off this cliff. Right? The problem is, as things grow, you know, my application runs really great on one machine in one memory space. But then my data is just slightly bigger than one machine, so now I've got to shard it. And my complexity goes up. My ability to be performant and efficient rapidly drops. And different parts of this, there are many different reasons for that performance, my ability to write code, my ability to add value, to drop off. And I call it the, the complexity cliff. And this can be caused by your bill getting too big. This can be caused for me when a project gets so big I can no longer hold it in my head. When I can hold a project in my head, I can reason about the entire system. When you've got a project that spans 500 developers and 10 million lines of code, you can't even keep up with the rate of change. So the danger is there that without guards in place, that you're going to struggle to make progress because those interactions, those interplay between components, suddenly come to dominate your entire life. So how do we deal with these complexities? Can we, can we fix it? My short answer is no, you can't. Right? There is always cliffs here. There is always cliffs on how much performance I have in one computer, how much compute I can afford, how big the code base is, disk space, how big a project that Git can cope with. In fact, I've seen projects where you've had to optimize Git because it cannot no longer check out the project without timing out. Right? All of these random things can suddenly throw you from a project where you're really efficient to a project where you're sort of grinding through and just about coping, or you're making, you know, we were talking, uh, the previous speaker was talking about the fact that people are suddenly like, how do I hack this to get past this onto doing something useful again? So there are always these, these points at which your efficiency is going to drop. But what you can do is you can stretch them out. You know, this startup efficiency, for example, um, with a notebook, your startup efficiency is basically zero. Right? You, you spin up a new notebook, you're ready to go. With a Scala project, you know, maybe you have a company standard template that says, here's how to do a Kubernetes-backed project and all the, all the bells and whistles you need to start writing your actual application. Can you get off this cliff? Well, yes, you can, you can try and avoid it. You can put mitigation in, but you can't get away from it. Now, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to... The other one that I started talking about earlier is especially the data science model. Reminds me a lot, I remember this diagram. I remember this diagram from university and even in those days this was considered bad. It's the waterfall model. It might not be called the waterfall model, but we create a model, we convert it to production, we run it, we monitor it, and then, oh, it's not quite right. Send it back to the data scientists for round two. We've got to do better. Right? We know this is broken. <laughs> so how do we fix it? The truth is, I don't know all the answers. But what I do know is that we already have some solutions to this. Right? Number one is, you have to start embedding software developers with data scientists or data scientists with software engineers. Right? Agile teams aren't software developers. They're software developers, they're designers, they're data scientists. They're all the people collaborating together because that collaboration often takes the edge off some of these cycles. 
we need to think about tooling. Tooling's not easy, right? Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Thomas here is, was just nodding to that. Tooling is hard, right? I'm sure the entire Virtus Labs is laughing at this point. Tooling is hard, right? Making one big Uber system to fix all the things is generally, that works up until a point and then you fall off a cliff. Or if you ever use some of the online things to build your web app and deploy it, it's great right until it doesn't work. So what can we do? We can, we can address some of this stuff. We can start thinking in a more agile way. We can start to embed things. We can start building tools, not Uber tools, but pieces of tooling <coughs> to help us. For example, one of the things I've been working on at the Trade Desk is simply something that allows us to write a, a Spark script in IntelliJ right, and deploy it and run it to my Databricks cluster, but also to be able to export it as a jar so it can be used in the notebook. And yeah, I want to write my code slightly differently in a more functional style so I can use it in a notebook as well and experiment and get the benefit of managed code, but also those abilities to run those little experiments. So I don't have a solution yet. Hopefully, maybe next year if I'm invited back again. Got to keep my average up. We can talk about some of the attacks we've taken on these problems, but I think it's a really interesting space. And software feels like it's in the 80s in this game at the moment, and I think there is so much opportunity to do better. So last but not least, thank you. Here's my LinkedIn profile. Uh, we at the Trade Desk are hiring everybody from hardcore software engineers to hardcore data scientists and machine learning experts. Uh, if you're interested at all, please come and talk to me or ping me on LinkedIn and say hello. I'd be delighted to talk to you. And that's it. Any questions? I think we have time for two questions. So Daniel's uh, over there. With Daniel, Daniel there. Okay, I've got two questions boiled into one, so I'll kind <laughs> of leave room for someone else. Um, the biggest problem that I see with uh, sort of a practical model productionalization is that it usually involves some form of infrastructural provisioning. Like you can't just take the notebook and then translate it into Java and like make it magically better. Like you have to spin up a pipeline and like allocate a database and like you've got like all these different things that you have to do. It's a fundamentally different task. So my question is basically, how do you bridge those worlds? Like, how do you even see a path from here to there where we have this very, very fast iteration notebook style thing or like playing around and like PyTorch or something like that versus like running it in production is like almost a separate universe. How do we go about building tooling and languages and ecosystems that start to bridge that gap? And here's my second question, why is Unison the answer? Sorry, what was your second question? And why is Unison the answer? Why is Unison <laughs> the answer? Sorry, I didn't mean to prompt you, but like, <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of where my brain went. So like. Yeah, this is, it's, it is a, a really challenging problem. Fortunately, the, the bits of pieces I've been playing with are really Spark pipelines at the moment for machine learning. So yeah, there are productionization. In fact, Databricks provides an ability to run a notebook as a, as a you know, repeated pipeline that runs daily. We don't do that because as a technologist, it's a horrible thing to support. It just doesn't work. It doesn't give you the monitoring and the reliability and all the, all the bells and whistles. Um, to answer your, your, your more broader question, um, I don't know. I wish I did, because I'm sure it'd be worth a lot of money. <laughs> and this is a hard problem. But one of the things I've learned about tooling is often Small incremental changes can be, can be hugely beneficial. You can get that 80-20 benefit from even, even small improvements in these thinking about these pipelines. But yeah, I, uh, I don't have a solution yet. I hope to. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, on here. Uh, I, does it work? Okay, uh, I do have one question. So we work a lot with data scientists inside of the computer vision team here. And as you said, there is a lot of Jupyter notebooks. And as you said, they are not really repeatable. I mean, at the beginning of each, each notebook, we have the uh, path to some directory of some data. And of course, if I clone this repository, there is no data there. So there is no repeatability. 
And do you feel like in this space, in data science space, the enforcing of some rules will work? So as a software developers, we are enforcing on ourselves some rules as for typing, code stylings, and so on, whatever. Will it work in data science space? Is, is it even achievable to enforce the rules? Oh, that's a really good question. Is it possible to sort of enforcing rules is is hard, right? People will work around rules that get in their way and, and slow them down. So, how can we how can we improve on that? How can we? Th th you want the moon on a stick, right? We want the the data scientists to be able to do their thing as fast as they possibly can, and we want repeatability, productionization, all these things. I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Wonderful talk, as always. So thank you. Uh, feel free to you know to come. Feel invited next time. Oh, next year, hey. we we are already waiting for the results of your you know experimentation. But <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, I'll have something valuable to share. But we'll see. You always do. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.